and specifically C sharp at that point. A uh, question came up earlier, can we utilize VB uh, with, uh, with Silverlight? The answer is yes, and let me just break out for just a moment and show you that here is a sample project in VB, and just like I would in C sharp, I have everything laid out with my XAML file and then my code behind with the .VB. The XAML is no different, it's the same language. However, if I was to start a new project, when you look under the templates under Visual Basic, I have one, two, three, approximately six templates that I can utilize. And notice there is no 3D capability here in Silverlight. However, when I utilize C Sharp, and I look at the templates there for Silverlight, you'll notice that there is two additional templates, and those two are primarily for the 3D application and the 3D library. Don't ask me why, that's just one of the things that Microsoft had done. They always strive to bridge the gap between C Sharp and VB, but the more they strive to do that, the more there seems to be a separation. Um, and this is a perfect example of it. So again, you can run Silverlight in VB, but when it comes to the 3D capabilities that are offered within Silverlight 5.0, right now it can only be done within uh, C Sharp. So then in 2008, we were able to utilize the uh, .NET Framework 3.0, and then we were able to execute it in any .NET language, uh, as we discussed earlier. Um, then moving on, every year there has been a major release in 2009 with Silverlight 3.0, um, and there we were able to save files on the system using the save file dialog, so we had some access to the user's machine. And then with Silverlight 4, which was released in 2010, it continued to have features and we were able to get the webcam and microphone support as well as some of the other WCF uh, capabilities as well. Uh, moving right along into 2011, Silverlight 5 was released on December 9th and that also offered a myriad of features. So here we have um, uh, some data binding expressions that we'll look at later that allow us to, to bind two different controls and be able to look at the, the binding there. It also gives us the capability to do 3D using XNA APIs, and it also allows us to uh, some text capabilities where we can format text in a, in a much richer fashion than, uh, than we can otherwise. In addition, we're able to do in-browser HTML, and there is the 64-bit browser support that's offered as well. This is just a highlight of some of the features that are offered. As we dive into it a little bit deeper, we'll see that, the, that they're categorized in different areas. So we have the binding where we talk about the ancestor and relative source binding and implicit data templates. And then we get into graphics where we see that it has an improved graphics stack specifically relating to the utilization of XNA and the 3D templates. Again, only offered within the C-sharp templates. Um, also, under the category of media, we're able to utilize the, the sound using the XNA and uh, remote control features, and what that is referring to are the uh, buttons that are located on the keyboard for pause, start, and advance as you're advancing tracks on a CD player. It's the same thing. You can also use that for your in-browser manipulation of the media. And then, in addition, um, we have some uh, text tracking features where we're able to display multi-columns and we're able to draw on the screen and have overflow, as we'll see in one of the demos. Um, and then within the operating system integration, we have a feature called uh, P-Invoke or Platform Invocation. And what that allows us to do is to essentially make uh, calls from managed code into unmanaged code or the kernel code and be able to execute a command directly against that, those APIs. Um, as I mentioned before, we have 64-bit browser support. There's also a power awareness feature uh, for the solo group. Now we're getting a little bit deeper into the OS and we're able to reach in and find out exactly what's going on in the user's machine with the power awareness and the PINFO. Some of the other features, um, again, we have some multi-core JIT for improved startup time and some uh, parser performance improvements. Uh, for controls, there's double and triple click support. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit odd, but those also do have their place when you're uh, coding an application. And then, um, as listed down at the bottom, um, 
there's also pivot viewer and combo box pipe ahead that's included within the uh, tool set. And then some miscellaneous changes include the in-browser HTML and PostScript. So as you can tell, there's a whole lot of features that are offered that we probably won't be able to get to every one of them tonight. However, I do have a full variety of, uh, of demos that we can go through, approximately six to seven uh, demos that we, can, uh, that we have time to step through. Some of the features that I had mentioned were already pre-existing in WPF, and if you recall, the features within Silverlight are a subset of WPF, so it used to be available within the desktop environment, but now we're bringing them into the web capabilities of Silverlight. So those three right off the top are the uh, relative source binding, um, and the implicit data templates, and then the 3D graphics. We've been able to do that within the desktop environment, now it has moved over into the Silverlight realm. When installing it, um, basically you run through and you want to get your developer runtime, um, and then you want to get your Silverlight 5 tools. And notice there's a difference between Silverlight 5 tools and Silverlight 5 toolkit. Those are two different downloads uh, from two different locations. <coughs> Actually, I take that back. You can download it all from silverlight.net. Um, but that was the order that I installed on my, on my machine. Uh, the only problem I've had was with the 3D, which unfortunately we'll be able to see that tonight. But again, that is something that I think can be resolved through the installation and uninstallation of the, uh, of the downloads. Any questions so far? All right. So ancestor relatives and source binding, basically it can bind a child object property to a parent object. And uh, basically that allows us to add additional properties to determine the type of the parent object. Um, and we can determine how many levels up it is from a child. So as you know, when, uh, in a WPF or Silverlight application, you have the controls that are built up in a tree, if you will. And so you have the parent and then you have children underneath and children of children. So with this, it allows us to indicate how many levels up we can go to bind them so that way things have the same look and feel and we have better control over that. There's a property ancestor type which can specify what to bind to and we'll see a, a demo of that in just a little bit. And there's also an interface provided, the iCustom type provider, which enables data binding of objects until, which are unknown up until you start the execution of the code during runtime. All right, so with that, we'll dive into the demos.